Thank you for coming to our seminar. It's on um, how to effectively enforce debt collection after a judgment. And we're honored to have a local attorney, Jennifer Walters, and representatives from RCA, which is Retail Retailers Credit Association. Retailers Credit Association. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Walters. I'm a local from the area, a new graduate, and I've been an attorney practicing here in Nevada City since 97, 10 years as of this month. And um, I've had a private practice, and adding to that practice in the year 2000, I became legal counsel for one of the local collection agencies, Retailers Credit Association. And we have Sheila Baker and Kathy McCombs from RCA to address a couple of the points on my outline towards the end of the... I'll just dive right into it. I think most of you folks are either creditors seeking to enforce a judgment you may already have, or if you're wondering whether or not you want to pursue a debt that you're entitled to collect. So I hope that we can give you the, the information um, to help guide you in making that decision and determining whether it's a worthwhile cause for you. So um, as you can see initially in the outline, I've, I've distinguished between written contracts and verbal contracts. General rule of thumb is an oral contract is enforceable. There are seven exceptions, excuse me, there's eight exceptions where you must have a written contract. Most of these won't necessarily apply to your situation, um, but I did outline them here. I don't want to belabor that point, but I did want to briefly outline what contracts are required to be written in order to be enforceable. Uh, the first one is a performance where a contract, uh, performance of a contract is beyond a year of its making. And the second one is if you, if somebody promises to answer the debt of another person, you need to make sure that that, um, that promise is written in order to enforce it. One that might be a little more common is the sale of goods valued at 500 or more. There's no reason why you can't write up a little bill of sale for that um, if you ever need to pursue collection on that. Sale of real property, that's kind of an obvious one. I don't think anybody would be foolish enough to purchase or sell land without a written contract. Um, probably the most common, and maybe some of you folks are landlords, if you have a lease or a rental agreement that involves a term of longer than one year, you definitely need to have that in writing in order for it to be enforceable. The next category is if you're creating an agency relationship for the purpose of the sale or lease of uh, real property. Next one, if the performance is beyond the lifetime of the person making the promise. So if something is to happen beyond that person's death, that has to be in writing. Otherwise, it would be quite difficult to, uh, to enforce. And then, of course, making loans or extending credit for $100,000 or more if they're not simply for household or family purposes. So that kind of aside, that's really not the most important thing that we're here today uh, to explain to you. But I do want to point out that a written contract, you have four years from the date of the breach to bring your lawsuit. And um, w another advantage of having a written contract is you can include language in there that would allow you to recover your attorney fees should you prevail in a lawsuit. <laughs> Otherwise, you would not be entitled to, to recover that cost <coughs> unless there's some other statute that allows for that. But by and large, you have to have that as a provision in your written contract in order to collect. And of course, your written contract can also um, warn somebody that you are entitled to costs and interest on any amount that they that they owe you. And one little note I included, don't confuse a credit application with an actual contract. So depending on what your situation is, if you're a merchant and you're extending credit to somebody, that credit application does not create a contractual relationship between you and the person that you're extending that credit to. <coughs> Verbal contracts, they're great, but how do you prove it? You've got to have witnesses lined up. You have to have some type of evidence to show how you're going to establish the terms of your contract. So in this day and age, there's no reason why you can't reduce your written agreement to writing. I have several clients that have been performing services for folks on a handshake. And as you can imagine, that creates some real problems. So short of a, some invoices, some billings, another witness who was there to, to overhear you know, the terms of the contract being formed, it makes for a very difficult case to prove should you need to go to court. And the other big thing on, writ on verbal contracts is you only have two years from the date of the breach to, to uh, bring your lawsuit. So as soon as you find out that the person is breached or as soon as they fail to make payments as promised, you've got to calendar that date and determine was this based on a written contract? If so, you've got four years to sue. 
or was it an oral agreement, in which case you only have two years to sue. And once that time goes, it's gone. Okay, having said all that, uh, deciding whether to sue and obtain a judgment. I think the biggest um, hurdle you have to first overcome is deciding, can I prove my case? Can I prove that I've got a breach of contract claim? So again, it goes back to written contract versus verbal. What kind of evidence do you have? Um, because you've got to prepare for a lawsuit, essentially. And you want to get a copy of your signed contract, if you've got that. You want to have any invoices or billings that you've provided to this person. Um, any checks that they've given you it, as part of a payment, if you were accepting payments from them. Anything that can prove your case. And, um, and witnesses, of course. You want to line up any other witnesses that may have information. And you can essentially take it to trial. And if the amount is under $5,000, you can go to small claims court. In small claims court, you represent yourself. Neither party is allowed to have an attorney present. And if the amount that is due is over $5,000, you can go to superior court. And you could still choose to represent yourself, or you can have an attorney represent you in superior court. And once you file a lawsuit and you serve the defendant with the paperwork, they have 30 days to respond and file a written answer with the court. Once that 30 days comes and goes, you can go into court and get a default judgment against them. And that's what I have here under item two, trial versus default. You either prove your case and go, uh, go the distance up to a judgment from a court trial, or you can have a default judgment. And by and large, the kind of folks you might be dealing with, the debtors, are the type that if they don't care to the point where they're not paying you what they owe you, they're not going to care much about a lawsuit. So there's a good chance you would proceed straight to default. <coughs> now, ability to collect a judgment. This is, you know, I think the $64,000 question. Um, some folks like to pursue these cases on principle. Maybe it's a personal relationship you have with the person that owes you money, <coughs> and you're not backing down. You don't care that they're penniless. You don't care that they're renters. They don't have an asset to speak of. You want that piece of paper. You want something that says, he owes me money, or she owes me money. Um, thank you. And uh, I'm a little hoarse today, so <coughs> bear with me. I'm trying to get through some allergies. Anyway, so on judgment, you might just, or excuse me, on principle, you might want that piece of paper just for the sake of having it. Well, it's just a piece of paper. It's a piece of paper that says that you are entitled to collect this money from this person. It's accruing interest as time goes on, um, but it's only as good as your ability to collect it. So one of the things you want to consider, I think, initially before you even decide to sue, is what is what are my chances to collect money from this person? So you want to take a look at the debtor's assets. And um, one of the things I initialed here is maybe the person moves out of state. And you're thinking, all right, there it goes. There goes my chances. He's gone. He's out of state. Well, don't necessarily give up because there are ways to enforce a judgment in another state. And that's a whole other lecture, but just to let you know that there is something uh, that is available to you to pursue somebody who moves out of state once you've obtained a judgment against them here in California. So ways, um, things you need to look at for assessing the debtor's assets. First and foremost, is this person employed versus are they self-employed or working under the table or an independent contractor? Do they have an employer for which you could garnish some wages? Another thing you want to look at, do they own property? Are they owners of real property here in this county, maybe another county? That's probably the best asset that you could find to, to make your otherwise unsecured lien secured. Okay? <coughs> so employment, owners of property, do they have bank accounts? Again, have they, have they made payments to you with a check? Keep track of what bank accounts they may have because there is a way to um, put a levy on their bank account. And it could also lead to a safety deposit box if it's at, at the same bank branch where they bank. Um, if the bill or debt is for a necessity of life, things like clothing, housing, shelter, uh, medical care, you could look to their spouse for collection. So maybe, just to pick on the men a little bit, maybe the husband is the one who owes you the money, but he has no job to speak of, his name's not on the title of anything, but wife is employed, is an owner of real property, if it falls within these necessity of life categories, if the debt that was created is one of these things, 
then there's a way to get a court to order that her assets can be used to pay this debt. Um, sources of information where you could look, yeah. And why is the debt only for necessities a lot? How about for buying a DVD? It's just the way the statute's written, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it does limit it to those items so that for that reason, I mean, I can only speculate why the legislature wrote it the way they did, but, um, no. Because I, it seems to me, uh -huh. as a consumer, sure. that I would forgive somebody because they need food or they need a car or something, mm -hmm. but if somebody has borrowed the money to buy... Uh, something frivolous. A television, yeah. Uh -huh. Then it makes sense to, do, I mean, to me that it's a, do a judgment. Mm -hmm. But for food and clothing, weird. I can't explain that one. Can't explain it. But that's my understanding of how the statutes are written. Who's sure. wife are we talking about? The debtor, debtor or the creditor? Who's, who's I'm life? Who's necessity of necessities life. of life. The family's necessities. The person that borrowed the money's life or the person that owes owed the money's well, life? Well, if they're married, it's... No, no, I'm not, that's not my question. Is it, let's say they owe me money and I need the money to stay alive. Can I go... Oh, oh, that's, oh, that's I understand. Party. It's, it's... <laughs> what, they, what they owe you was spent on their necessities okay. of life. Okay. Um, so sources of information where you can find some asset information from folks. Um, public records are a great resource. The county recorder's office is where you'd look to find out if they own any real property in this county or go to the counties of um, any of the surrounding counties as well. You could look up marriage certificates there, death certificates. If, if you have a feeling the debtor has um, passed away or you read it in a public notice in the newspaper, you, as a creditor, would have an interest in filing a creditor's claim against that probate. So you want to keep track of if this person still alive or if, has they pa have they passed away. Um, asset location services, there's um, services locally or, or otherwise or on the internet that can do these, these types of searches for you. Other creditors, if you know where, if they have debts with other folks, no reason you can't have an exchange of information there. Other court files, um, especially for you landlords out there, you can go to the civil clerk's office and punch in the person's name and see if they've ever had any other eviction proceedings against them. That's something you definitely want to know before you would rent to somebody. You can do the same at the criminal clerk's office. Ask them to pull any files. It's all public record. You can ask them to pull the names of, of an individual, see if they have any convictions, see if they have any pending criminal charges. That would reveal a lot about this person. The criminal clerk's office is right here next to the pay phones. That deals with criminal cases. And then the civil clerk's office is where you first walked in up the steps to your left. That's where all the civil filing is. And they have a, a computer there. And you can enter somebody's name and it'll spit out any names of any cases that they've ever been involved in. And those files, with the exception of juvenile and maybe something else. Is unlawful detainment for 30 days. Is, does, is it remained sealed for that long? Okay. Right, it's so for conservatorships. Conser yeah, there's a few exceptions to them being public records, but by and large, you can find out a lot of stuff here in our own courthouse. Um, <clears throat> I've indicated be sure to keep photocopies of any checks you have received from this person, so that you've got documentation as to where they bank, assuming they still are banking there when the time comes. Um, credit reports. Uh, there's a wealth of information in uh, credit reports, and I'll have. Uh, either Sheila or Kathy from RCA addressed that a little bit as to the services that a collection agency can provide to landlords, for example, who want to obtain credit reports on prospective tenants. And uh, newspaper, I touched on that. Um, articles about recent arrests. You know, you might see somebody's name and they're now in custody. Um, or they were recently sentenced, to, sentenced for some reason. You now know they have a criminal case pending against them. Marriages, deaths, DBAs. Um, again, arrest reports and business sales. You just, you know, that's a, our local paper is a wealth of information if you just kind of know what you're looking for. Um, I address the difference between small claims court and superior court. That's where you, basically the big difference is the amount of money that you're suing for. $5,000 or less is where you want to be in small claims court. You represent yourself and so do they. And then a superior court is anything above 5000 And if you want an attorney to represent you, you have to be in superior court.
Um, I just wanted to clarify, just this year, the small claims went up to $7,500. No. If you're an individual suing, if you're a partnership or a corporation, you're still limited at that $5,000. Oh, please. Oh. Yeah. And okay. they were talking about putting it up further, but they just put it up to 75 If you're an individual suing. For some reason, corporations, partnerships, if you have more than just an individual, it's still limited to the 5000 I wonder why that is. Yeah. Okay. Um, then the last thing here is, what if your debtor has no assets? What if this person's the quintessential deadbeat? No property, no job, pays you in cash, you don't know where it's coming from. Um, don't necessarily give up. They may acquire assets later. Maybe they'll inherit some money. Maybe 10 years from now they'll get their act together and buy some property, own a home. Once you obtain a judgment, it's good for 10 years, and then you can renew it for another 10 and another 10. So if you start out with someone in their 20s, they don't seem to have much of anything at this point in time, maybe another 10 years from now they will acquire a house, and then you can seek to enforce your judgment later on in life. Um, but again, a debtor with no assets, you have to ask yourself, is this worth it? Is it worth my time and trouble to pursue this? Because it is going to cost you money to pursue a lawsuit. There's a filing fee to file your complaint. You've got to get this person served. You have to pay someone to serve them with the paperwork. Um, once we get beyond the judgment and you seek to enforce it, there's more out-of-pocket costs to obtain these other pieces of paper you need to go after property, to go after bank accounts and so forth. So it's going to cost you some money. It is recoverable, ultimately, as part of your judgment. But again, you just have to wonder if it's worth your time and trouble to go after someone who's going to be um, a real pain in your neck, so to speak. Okay, so now you have your judgment. You've got your piece of paper that says you're owed this amount of money from this person. What do you do with that piece of paper? Again, um, first thing you're entitled to do is what's called a debtor's exam. You can subpoena this person and have them come to court, swear to testify on their own, and answer all kinds of financial questions. And you can delve into all kinds of things. And I've attached on uh, the back of your outline a sample examination that gives you an idea how broad of a question you can ask to these folks diving into all their financial uh, information. So that's where you, it's kind of like a, you know, a, a hunting exp expedition. You want to find out what they have. Maybe there's some investments that you didn't know about. And they are, they are um, supposed to testify under oath. If you have any difficulty with this person, you come back, you bring them before the judge, and um, ultimately they could be held in contempt if they don't comply with the subpoena. You can have them bring documents to the debtor's exam with you, bank records, phone records, all kinds of information. So I just wanted to attach that there to give you some idea of what, how powerful a debtor's exam can be. And again, this is if you want to represent yourself and do it. Um, but, you know, if you don't, there's attorneys that can do that or you can say, I don't want to hassle with it and you can assign your debt to a third party for them to pursue these things for you. Um, Okay, lien on real property. It's an abstract of judgment. That's probably the most secure form of, um, of anything to, to uh, try to enforce your judgment. You have to obtain a piece of paper from the court and you file that piece of paper, excuse me, you record that piece of paper with the recorder's office where the property is located. So if they own property here in Nevada County, you record it there. And now there's a secured lien on that property. Should the property ever sell? or be refinanced, you're now one of the secured creditors. You're going to get paid out of that sale. <coughs> Same thing if they own property in Placer County. You've got to go down to the, the county where the property is located. If you're not sure if they own property, but you know they reside in Nevada County, you're not sure if they own it here because maybe you haven't had time to do your homework at the recorder's office or whatever, you could still record it here in Nevada County, and if they acquire property later, that's going to attach to them. So it's a good way to anticipate if they ever will become property owners what you can do. So you, you, again, you can record it where they reside in hopes that at some point in time they will acquire property in that county and now you've got your, your abstracts recorded and you're at least secure. Sit back, cross your fingers, hope that they sell or refi someday. Then you might see a check. Can I ask a quick question please? Sure. It goes back, the debtor's exam. Uh -huh. They have to be subpoenaed for that so do you a process server? Yes. You pay a process server to... There's, okay. there's forms to do a subpoena. You get them personally served with that because it's compelling their attendance at a court hearing. Okay. And they have to show up and they're sworn by the clerk. 
and you're usually sent off into another room or maybe in the hallway wherever there's a quiet space available and they're supposed to come with all their documents that you've requested as part of your subpoena and um, you ask them all kinds of questions. And where do I leave off? Sorry. That's okay. Yeah. What happens if... I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, if you know they own property out of state, you're not sure which state it's in, um, how can you go about finding that information? You just don't, you, do you you don't know what state it's in. Exam. It's in the Dakota somewhere. That's all I know. Hmm. I would, well, obviously if you know what state to at least start your search in, contact an asset locator service in that state. You could find a, 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 there's attorney services out there that have people that will run to court and do research for you, or, or you could pay an investigator to go to the, you know, that county's recorder's office and start doing a search. I don't know, at least myself, of any nationwide asset locator service. Um, but if you can at least hone it down to one or two states and then, you know, pay someone to do that homework for you with the county offices, you or can just eventually... call them in on the debtor's judgment exam and have them show, bring yeah, the papers? Yeah, if they come in, tell them to bring deeds to all their property. You know, that's why that debtor's exam is so powerful. What happens if a person lies <coughs> under oath and wins his case by, by lies and prevarication and, uh, and they win their case? and you have to take it to the next step uh, and get a different judge who, uh, and, and it will cost you a fee. Uh, so can you, the fact that they lied and the fact that they, they won their case and, they won the, and you have the, have the bills to show uh, mm -hmm. that you have paid for, the, for that and yet they, they don't pay attention to these bills and they put in another bill which, which is a false. Uh, uh, you mean you, you sue someone and during the course of your suit against somebody, they lie. They lie. And they win. And they Meaning win. You, lo you lost your suit and there's a defense. Right. right. And they ch also changed the, the, uh, the, that which was sued for. In other words, we were sued for one thing and then we get to court and they changed the suit to something else. And they said they were allowed to do this. And, they, and then, then, they, then they said that, that, they would, that the, uh, this was permitted, it, that they permitted it here. And so now we're being sued for something entirely different from what they were sued for before. We're not prepared for this. The judge said, and then he lies about that. I mean, if it's a constant lie. Uh, well, I'm trying. Procedurally, what you're saying doesn't make sense. Right. So what I'm wondering if is you sue someone and they're countersuing you and bringing in some other issue and a countersuit. No, they, they sued us. Okay. They sued us. Um, they, they, they want to double pay basically for something that we had already paid for. Uh -huh. But um, when we got the papers in the mail, it said in, in our case, concrete tanks. So we were prepared to be sued for the concrete tanks. Uh, during, th during the court hearing, they changed it and they said, oh, uh, we didn't mean concrete tanks, we mean pump pump. So, and uh, so the judge said, oh, that's okay. Well, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just assume that you're now suing for the pump. Okay, At and so point, you lost that. The, 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 the suit should have been thrown out. But or or certainly proceed. continued to give you an opportunity to adequately prepare there if you're now being hit with something right. different. That's right. That's so right. it proceeded and then you lost. We right. lost. Did you appeal? We are now in the process okay. of Okay, well then that's the process you got to go through. Which will cost another $80, which, right. is, which is here, are we which, liable? Which you could recover if you ultimately prevail. Oh, right. okay. The winner gets their costs. Is okay. it how, about, how about other items now? They've hit us with some more bills, which are, are uh, another well, bill. Well, you just got to defend against it the way you would if, if that was the initial suit against you. You know, I mean, you can't control what, what's going to be flung at you. You just have yeah. to respond appropriately. And if you lose in a, def in a small claim suit, the defendant has a right to an appeal. Yeah. And he also swore that he had never been sued before. And, and and we check, and he's been sued many times. And times. did he make that statement after yes, he had he already made that been sworn in? Too. He made that statement in court. He's well, never been sued before. I mean, technically, that's perjury. It's a crime. That's what I, I, I would think so. What is? It must you not can, be much of a, of, a, of a penalty for for perjury and for libel. It must not be because otherwise, why we do it so often? So I wonder if it holds any effect when you hold up your head and swear. Well, you know, some people take the oath seriously, and other people don't. Uh -huh. And it is a crime to commit perjury. It's something what is, that somebody, what is the penalty for it? 
It's it's a crime. It could be charged as a misdemeanor or a felony. How much is it? That must be pretty light. Well, like any crime, you could do jail time. You could do fines. I mean, you, if, if it's something you want to report, you might want to contact the DA's office and let them know that you've got proof of somebody committing perjury. Can we get records of, of, of a, of a small place court? For the, if, it was if there was a court reporter, which it, there probably wasn't. So, so you wouldn't have any right. kind of transcript. So, so that, yeah, but there's witnesses if there were other folks in court that heard heard the statements that were made. And the judge would he would he be willing to, to verify? What Technically, you could be a witness. If you want to go that route? Okay. All right. Um, Okay, we've dealt with the lien on your real property, assuming they've got some real property. Now there's also personal property that you can attach. Most common is a, most common is a wage garnishment. So again, if your debtor's employed, you obtain some paperwork, and those papers are served on the employer, who is then charged with the responsibility of, of taking out a percentage of their paycheck. Generally, it's 25% of their wages um, end up in your pocket, and that just hap you know, happens indefinitely until the judgment's paid off. So that's a nice, secure way to do it, assuming the person holds their job. And um, again, uh, there could be an assignment order on commissions. So a good example of someone on commissions might be a real estate agent. They aren't necessarily someone's employee, but they get paid through commissions. So you can obtain an order from a court that would um, guarantee that you're getting a portion of their commissions um, delivered to you. A bank levy. Again, this is why you want to keep track of any bank account information you might have on this person. <coughs> a sheriff delivers paperwork to a bank, and um, basically there's a right to uncover what accounts they may have there. You don't want to necessarily limit your request to a specific bank account number, because for you know they might have four different accounts at that bank. You just want to include a request for any and all accounts that that person has at that bank. And it can include a safety deposit box, which quite frankly, you can go in, a sheriff can go in, again with the appropriate order, and crack open the safety deposit box and see what's in there. And uh, business assets, again, if you're going after, I mean, there's a huge difference between consumer debts and uh, commercial debts. But just generally speaking, if the person you're suing is a business, then um, different a business has different assets than a person would, such as accounts receivable, equipment, um, negotiable instruments, a title, inventories, things of that nature. So there's ways to get access to this, <coughs> these assets. Jennifer, I have a question. A lot of people come in and they want to um, <coughs> attach uh, income tax <coughs> return money. They, the, the debtor has said, well, you know, I'll pay you when I get my in income tax return. And Boy, I really haven't had the time to research it, but can't. Do you know <coughs> of anybody that... I've never heard of that. Have you guys ever heard I don't know that a private party or um, third party, such as we are, can. I know that Nevada County Collections, they will get paid out of uh, refund money. As a government entity, they have the ability. They to, have the ability to, to attach yeah. it. I don't know how anyone else, a private party, can. Okay. <coughs> I haven't learned the way yet either. I'll be looking. But they can. The government entity can understand. Okay. So I know they do. They're all connected. Yeah. Um, as a as a cautionary note, at least for um, for you creditors. Just be aware that a debtor can file what's called a claim of exemption and basically ask, some, ask the court to relieve them from having to um, turn over as much as you're asking for. You know, I'm trying to simplify things. But um, I've in included in the packet on the back, the last two pages, is a pretty extensive list of what types of assets are exempt from collections. So just because somebody is collecting um, you know, some sort of pension or benefits of some kind, it's not necessarily going to be something you can get your hands on, but um, you obviously have the right to oppose their claim. So if, if they try to make a claim of exemption, you obviously have to be served with that, and there's a hearing to be held, and then you can in turn oppose it, saying, look, Judge, they're being too greedy, they're asking for too much of an exemption here, look at the statute, and let's apply the equation appropriately and figure out what we can get paid. I have heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, that at some point in time, 
judges if they see that the person, if the person doesn't have assets or has uh, too much debt, that even the judge can um, counsel the person to uh, uh, declare bankruptcy. That I've heard judge. I mean, judges aren't supposed to give advice, obviously, but I have heard them mention just as in terms of information that it's something that they may want to look into. Um, and that's certainly a risk, too. A debtor could just say, you know what? See this judgment? I'm going to go declare bankruptcy. You won't see a penny. And there's, there's, I'm not a bankruptcy lawyer. I don't know much about it. But if that happens, certainly talk to a bankruptcy lawyer and find out what remedies you may have as a creditor in that bankruptcy. Because you could still file a claim with the bankruptcy court saying, hey, I'm a creditor out here. I deserve some kind of money out of this once they do whatever it is they're going to do in the bankruptcy. And um, at least your claim's in there, and it will be considered. But there's a good chance that when someone you know, threatens you with bankruptcy, um, if this debt gets wiped out as part of that, then you, know, then you won't see anything. But I don't have a lot of experience in that, so I just want to qualify it. Well, on that one, they also have to put in, if they do claim bankruptcy, they have to put in their income tax findings now. I don't know if they had to before. I don't know. But I know they have to show what their income is. Um, yeah, the tax that okay. they get back if they get okay. refunds. All right. And then the last option here for enforcing your judgment is don't do anything. Assign it to somebody else so you don't have to worry about it. Okay? And um, you can certainly assign your right to collect to a third party. And it can be, it could be a collection agency. It can be another lawyer to pursue that for you. But it saves you on out-of-pocket expenses because then that agency, whoever's pursuing it for you, will front those costs for you because they're going to see it in the end um, in terms of part of the judgment that they'll ultimately collect. When you refer it to a collection agency, it will credit report. So the person that you're going after will have a ding on their credit. And again, for those of you who have any, you know, it's more on principle, it's a personal uh, controversy between you and your debtor. Some people take some satisfaction in that. And uh, you know, and you don't have to deal with the person anymore. So it's nice to just get it off your chest, wait for hopefully someday that you will see a payment. But then that agency or that person that you've assigned the responsibility to will keep track of the, tr the life of the judgment, make sure it gets renewed for you, so you can just go on living your life and not, um, you know, keep How much worrying. How do you generally have to pay for these services? Like 10% of what? It's a contingency of some kind. I'll let, I'll let you know, RCA speak for themselves in terms of what they, what they would charge, mm -hmm. but it might be based on, um, it might be a case-by-case -case basis, so it's it's going to be a percentage of some kind, maybe 10, 20, 30. I'm not quite sure how that works, um, but I'm sure it has to do with how much money is assigned as well and the risk that the party's taking on pursuing it, too, because they have an interest in being successful because that's how they're going to get paid. So they may only want to pursue a, a debt on somebody who has some assets, you know. So, um, having said that, the next section here, know who you're dealing with. Um, yes, I'm I have a question on sure. the once you make that assignment, mm -hmm. and if you have a lien, then it, uh, it's actually the collection agency that takes care of the satisfaction of judgment. And is there any, as far as the judgment creditor, is there any legal fine? Uh, otherwise, if the Collection agency doesn't do that. Can come back at the judgment creditor not the lead not being uh, satisfied. Well, the the agency steps in your shoes. They have to pursue your rights and remedies. So I, I mean personally, I haven't um, seen a time where they failed to file that satisfaction. That's something that's just at least routinely in our practice in dealing with how we collect judgments. And and you're certainly going to hear from the debtor. Hey, I paid the judgment. I'm trying to refinance my house, and it shows that there's still this lien here. Why wasn't the satisfaction filed? So then, if you're doing this on your own, then that would be your red flag to go get that satisfaction filed right away. Yeah. But I, the law says you have to do it within, I think, 14 or 15 days of request. And when I confronted the collection agency, they said, well, there hasn't been requested. So, we'll, I mean, they've got income producing documents this call and maybe judge satisfaction of judgments this call. I, I don't know the business, but it seems to me that uh, I, I've officially made the request from the satisfied. I don't know if that uh, is what's meant by request, but it sounds 
satisfaction of the judgment. I hope that does not come back on the judge's credit. It shouldn't be the assignment. There's two elements yeah. to it. The first element, once it, all the fees and, and the dollar amounts have been paid, mm -hmm. would be to file a satisfaction at the court. And as a collection agency representing a, an assigned collection, we file that with the court. We send a letter and a photocopy of that to the debtor. The letter, the cover letter, explains what they need to do. And it's up to the debtor to then come back to the court and get a certified copy. It costs them a couple of dollars more. Get like a, a second original is what I call a certified copy. Um, and take that to the recorder and be recorded. The collection agency wouldn't file it necessarily with the recorder, but they get it officially filed with the court. So maybe that's where the gap is. And sometimes a couple of years later, we'll get a, years ago our agency, and we've been in business for 80 years this year, it, um, we would get phone calls from people saying, I satisfied that, I satisfied that. Well, our agency in the past, a long time ago, would just send a copy to the debtor of the satisfaction. But it didn't give them instructions that they needed to take to get the certi a certified copy and go to the recorder and record it. We changed all that. We have a nice cover letter that goes out and explains their options. And if it was filed in multiple counties, they need to record, you know, say it was in three counties, maybe they have property in three counties, they need to get three certifies and send them to each of those recorders. So okay. that could be where the breakdown is. If it didn't get recorded, and if it's been filed at the court and agency, that's as far as they, that's all that's required by law. So we leave it up to the, to the debtor, the defendant on the case, to actually get it filed and recorded, which will then take it off. Well, I look it up every once in a while. The EJ100 has not been filed yet. That's what, that's what you take care of, is, is the form that's itself. The, the satisfaction that's filed with the court, right. right. And then it's the judgment debtor that has to take it over, record it, to get that lien. Right. We send them a photocopy. We send a photocopy with that cover letter to the debtor. That isn't, okay. the recorder doesn't want to accept that. They have to have a certified copy, which is another few dollars. Right. And so we instruct them to go to the to the clerk's office to get the certified copy and then take it to the okay. assessor. Okay, I'm going to go uh, with the next section here. Oh, I had a question, and I don't know if either one of you could answer it, but how much do judgments cost? How many, you know, total cost? Cost. How much would it cost to go through the whole process? Depends on the, it depends on the dollar amount. Civil, um, we're looking at um, 180 to file, 300 if it's up above 10,000, I believe, and then you have your process serving probably another $65. And if it's per person, 65 per person. Or if they catch them both at the same time at home, it's 65 maybe and 45 for the second. Or, you know, it, Process service have different fees. When I started, they were more in the twenty-five, thirty-dollar range. Now they've gone up. Fees have more than doubled. But you're talking a good, just on a you know five thousand dollar case or something like that. Probably what two hundred fifty, two hundred sixty bucks to. But once you have the judgment, all the post-judgment costs, whether it's the processor fees or right, those all become rent, part of whatever. The They're added back into that. Those are collectible yeah. fees. Once you, you get your judgment. Point. And any money you spend trying to collect your judgment as far as court fees and recording fees, that's all recoverable as an after judgment cost. So you keep track of everything. Yeah, you've got to keep, keep your, your copies receipts. and your receipts. So. Um, my name is Kathy McCombs, and I've been a judgment collector for RCA for almost eight years now. So kind of have seen everything <laughs> going through the office. I work on a, a little bit different side of the issue because we're trying to collect the debt as a business, so we have a lot of different tools available to us um, that, that you as the individual would have. I'm going to go over um, what you should do before you extend credit or rent to someone um, so that you can lay the proper groundwork so that if it does become a bad debt and you do have to get a judgment, you'll be ahead of the game with the information. Uh, the first thing you should do is you should get the first and a complete name of each uh, person you're going to extend credit to. And that includes their AKAs. And the AKAs are important because if you do have to sue them later on down the line, uh, that's how you'd want to sue. You'd want to sue in all their names. Um, people hold property in different names. Uh, maybe their birth name is Robert, but they bought property under the name Bob. And if you sued them in Robert, you'd want to make sure that it was AKA Bob. So that's important. You need to get their complete address. Um, 
their full uh, cell, their phone numbers. I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> I'm not a great public speaker. Uh, you need to get all their phone numbers and their cell, cell numbers for each adult in the family that you're going to extend credit to. You wish to verify all their social security numbers and most people fill out an application, a credit application, but ask to see their social security card to make sure that they put down the correct number. Um, if you're a landlord or a tenant, how many landlord or tenants do you have here? Just a few. Um, it's really important to get their addresses for the past five years. And um, you can do tenant screening on them. We offer a service at RCA where you could sign up and we could do tenant screening for you. Um, there's a $12 fee for that. It's addressed here on number two under F. It's important to get a current credit report. Uh, their credit report is a snapshot of how they handle their financial obligations. So that's an important issue. Jennifer dealt with the um, issue of photocopying every check. And stay on top of that. As they pay their rent or they make payments to you, make a copy of that check or note that if it's a different bank or a different account number at the same bank. Because if you did have to get a judgment and sue them later down the line, you now have their banking information and you could um, attach the bank, uh, do a bank levy to get your money back that they owe you. <coughs> um, if you're a business, is there any, are there any companies here that are businesses? Maybe? Okay, you should have a um, sign posted in your office in case they write you <coughs> a bad check um, that there's a $25 fee and um, I do have the, the language for that afterward, we can go over that. Their application be, should be complete, their credit application should be completely filled out and you should go over it with them. Any references that they give you, you should verify them. It only takes a few minutes to stop, make the phone calls, and verify that what they're telling you is correct on the application. <coughs> and unfortunate, but a lot of people leave the things blank or they give you false information that doesn't help you in the long run if you do have to take them to judgment. Uh, physical um, description is something, when we take in a judgment, we ask the uh, creditor or the original plaintiff to give us a physical description to the best of their ability. Uh, it helps us with process serving when we wish to take them back to court for an order of exam. Um, it's just good information. If you can get about approximate height, what they look like, color of their hair, whether they wear grass, glasses, have a beard, that kind of thing. And you need to stay on top of the information and update it as the years go by, maybe if they're a renter for long term. Mm -hmm. um, stay on, you know, update it as you can see things happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's about it. Does anybody have any questions? I do. Um, people come into our office asking questions. I loaned my friend $5,000. And there's a note that's notarized between the two of them. You're going to pay me $5,000 back. Can they just give that to you, or do they have to have a judgment first? Uh, judgment affords you the legal teeth to go out and do the bank levies and the waste So they couldn't give it to you and... Right. We could take it as a straight collection. You but, could? Right. But it's better if you have a judgment, okay. because that gives it a longer statute of limitations. It's now 10 years right. rather than four. Right. And it, if you knew where they worked or whatever, you wouldn't be able to do anything as far as attaching their wages or garnishing their bank or any of that. So it's... It, Yes, you could assign it, but it would be better if it was a judgment. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Sheila Baker, and um, I have I worked at RCA since roughly May 26, 1996, but I bought it in 2000. So I have a little background and didn't really start out in life to do this, but it seems to be a big need. There's been a need forever. Just following up on uh, something that Kathy but that you just asked, a large percentage of our assignments are non-judgment assignments. Are they? Oh. Like small business. Large bulk, yes, yes. A lot of medical. Uh, mm -hmm. We do primarily, I mean, probably 75% of our business is medical. Wow. Doctors, offices, hospitals, that sort of thing. Um, so we will take, we take a lot to sue. In our queue, probably we have 75 or 80 right now that are up for suit that we're working our way through. And they continually feel it behind. So, um, as an we agency, don't understand you very well. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, to us because okay. my husband can hardly hear you. Okay, and we I take have hard time. we take a lot of assignments that are not judgment assignments already. <coughs> we spend a lot of time at court taking cases to court. Um, our first approach is to try to 
work things out, get a payment plan going. Um, you know, if someone is, doesn't have the ability to pay it in full, the debt in full. Um, but if it ends up going down the road and we find assets, and then we will take them to court. So uh, majority medical that we do, probably 75% of our business is medical. Uh, we take assigned judgments, if you get a judgment out there in the world, and, and, and we operate like every other collection agency, so uh, this isn't anything unique to us, but we'll take assigned judgments, and you know, you get a judgment, and you put it in the drawer, and a couple years later, you go, oh yeah, there it is, or, or whatever, and you don't know how to go about it, or there's emotion in, involved, or you lost track of the person, or whatever. We have a lot of um, ways we can locate, skip trace, and that sort of thing. Um, I think the last part, five, is a summary, basically a delin delinquent bill of what to do next or what next. Um, keep the lines of communication open as you're dealing with that person, be it they're a renter or if they signed a promissory note and they're making payments on it and suddenly two or three months have gone by and you haven't gotten a payment. Uh, time to make contact, verbal or written. Written is the best. Uh, make one last attempt to collect a debt and see we have be open to payments versus PIP, which is a paid in full. You might this person might owe you five thousand dollars, just picking a number. You want that five thousand and you're not willing, you want that five thousand, period. Just one lump sum. Uh, you may not be able to get it that way. We find that all day long. It just what your wishes are isn't necessarily what someone that owes you money can or is willing to do. So be open to a payment plan. I would get the payment plan in writing. They're going to send you 100 a month or whatever the terms are. And then we have D, be open to SIFs, and that's that's kind of an in-house settlement in full. Maybe um, they owe you that 5000 but they can only pay 4500 Will you take, they'll say to you, will you take the 4500 and call it a deal, a done deal? Uh, so a settlement in full is, you, know, you have to kind of weigh, the, weigh your odds of getting the full um, amount due you, or, you know, you have to kind of, Look at the situation, the person you're dealing with, and what your situation is, and sometimes payments, or sometimes a settlement might be your best route out, if you will. Um, one of the things that we do under E is we will suggest and try to help people with ways to pay the debt. And you know, maybe you can get a loan from a family member. You know, that would certainly get it off your queue and into, you know, let them deal with the family. Sell an asset. Maybe they have a car, an extra car, or a piece of land that, you know, they, they have two pieces of property. They live here and they have a, you know, a lot somewhere else. That might be a, a, a part-time job for a short duration. Sometimes if you suggest these things, it might be, might, you know, might be something that uh, they haven't thought of. Barter. Something you can do, we can't do once it's signed to us. We're, we're only collecting money, but, you, you, you know, maybe you can trade services. <coughs> and refinance um, a mortgage, that's another thought. Send a final notice um, before you're going to, if you decide, okay, I'm going to take this support, or I'm going to assign it, or whatever, you know, I, I can't get anywhere with it. Send them a final notice. Make sure it has your know, balance due. The final step, you know, it has to be paid within 10 days, 15, whatever. Um, and then what your next step is going to do, if you don't pay me within, 15 days, I will be pursuing legal action, or assignment, or whatever. Keep copies of everything. Keep copies if you if you do have a judgment and you flesh it, and you do go to do a wage garnishment or a bank levy. Keep copies of all of your paperwork. Keep copies of your receipts. Uh, I think Kathy or, or uh, Jennifer mentioned that if you do get a judgment down the road, and you you know it costs you. Seven dollars here, fifteen there, twenty-three there. To do these sorts of things, you do need the proof that you've done them. The court will have it. It's much easier if you have them in your file. Keep good records because it's, it's much easier. Yes. It's a reasonable length of time before filing a judgment against someone who hasn't who's defaulted on a loan, let's say. Well, it becomes delinquent at thirty-one days past the due date. Mm -hmm. Any debt is delinquent at so 30, any, 31 any days. Any after 31 days. You know, go through some time. steps. Give them, you know, and do them in writing. Mm -hmm. you know, send a notice, right? Send a notice certified, a final notice certified. That's another way that you have proof of what. And if it comes back, at least you know. Yeah. On that, the four-year statute of limitations, 
Is that based on the filing of the claim or the judgment of the claim? That's 31 days after it became delinquent. Well, I mean, the, the four year. Uh, to file a lawsuit. To file a lawsuit. Yeah, right. to file. Is that that's based the on at the statutes and it's at 31 days? So I have one that's like maybe two weeks away from that four year mark. Well, have they made any so, payments? So if I were to, if yeah, I were to make, oh, from a payment? If they've made oh, payments, that extends the four years. Oh, does it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. But then it is based on the filing. So it's like if I can file the suit, because it might take months to track this guy down, he would just Once you file the suit, that the filing is the benchmark. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because then you only have, I think the court's an hour, and I'm not an attorney. <laughs> Kathy and I are not attorneys, we're not advising you. But isn't there like a year that you have? I, I don't know, the after, courts give you kind of a. After you file it, you also have a piece of paper called a summons, and that's what you, you know, you serve the person with a copy of the summons and complaint. And the summons, it's been a while since I've had one go so long, but I think after 60, maybe it's 120 days, that summons the court. You have to go back into court to have mm -hmm. them issue a new summons. Okay. Um, but and you obviously the court's going to ask you what's going on. Why don't you have this person served yet? But but when you file it, you need to start taking some action to to right. pursue it. But if you miss that that initial filing date, then okay. you're... Yeah, I was just curious, because this is one we've kind of given up on, but, you know, with this information, it's like, you know, we might still be able to get the guy, but if it's based on a judgment, there wouldn't be time to get a judgment now. But if it's based on getting a claim filed, yes. and if that will extend that time for me to try to track this guy down and find him and then serve him mm -hmm. and then get the judgment, then right. still possible. Of course, you're going to pay 180 or so to file that. Right. Paper. Even, even for small claims? If your claim is up to fifteen hundred dollars, fifteen hundred to five thousand is a fifty dollar filing fee, and then five thousand to seventy five hundred now is a seventy five dollar filing fee. And that's added back into the judgment. If you're right. The judgment. And if you win, that's added to it. The important piece is you gotta get that demand letter because that checkbox is on the form. form of the you gotta have that demand letter. and file all those costs, you can't put it down. 
Which fine. includes your interest as well. You can do the interest, right? So let me ask you the, the uh, uh, the four years, that's just for the civil, that's just for contract, right? I mean, right. Personal liabilities, you got two years for Yeah, there's claims. all different kinds all of statutes with other causes okay. of action, but strictly written contract, breach of contract. It's four years. Four years. Okay. The law library is a big help, too, if you have questions. I think, oh, I don't know how, how in depth they yeah, go. Yeah, actually, we easy. have this book I put up here on the table. There's a book put out by Nolo Press on how to collect your um, <coughs> judgment after you've won a lawsuit. We have one in our office. Okay. They're, They're very, very handy. That would be a problem. Uh, there's a wealth of information on the web, by the way, yeah. on the self-help side. Right. For, for example, it's pretty sure technical. You're Reading something that pertains to California, that's what, you know, it's not, because there's statutes that are maybe one thing in California and it's something in another state. You just want to make sure you're reading something that pertains just to, Cal, you know, California's no, rules. So that's correct. Yeah. The, the matter of interest, uh, it's assumed that if you get a judgment, you're entitled to the 10% to the interest. <coughs> And, and that could get pretty detailed and a lot of, get a lot of help on the website and how to figure all that in if they make partial payments and, and that kind of stuff. We do a spreadsheet on so we know where we are, what's due, that is due. Um, and the legal forms are available online yes. too. Yes. So you can get you know your writs and your satisfactions and everything. It's important when someone, I think we did talk about it earlier, when a debtor pays off a debt, a judgment, to file your satisfaction. Creditors are supposed to file it within 15 days with the court. I want to thank you very much for joining us and sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you. Thank you.